right, we're uh, we're gonna get started. We'll I'll call the Houston Board to order. Call this regular meeting of the Reading Board of Education to order at session thirty one on October fifth. Uh, we'll start off with public comment. Just for the record, for any clarity, I have Laura Gibbons joining remotely, uh, Mike, John, and myself in person. All right. Um, I'm going to give Sarah 25 seconds to try and see if Mike's going to move all the board. So I'll call the Region 9 board meeting, regular board meeting, to order at 7.32. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. McKinney. I need to be able to shake. Sorry. You good now? Can we hand these out now, Dave? Yeah, yes, it's definitely handed out. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely handed out. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to our special guests, uh, Dr. Almeida and uh, some students from Joel Bowler High School. We're going to give them a warm introduction in just a, in just a moment. Uh, tonight, we plan to talk a little bit about our efforts related to developing a strategic plan, which is something that we started to work on last spring. We talked about it at convocation. We talked about it at our board meetings at the beginning of this year. Um, and tonight we're starting to give you an update on kind of where we are, and we want your input into some of the work that we've started. So tonight is really an opportunity to kind of get the board's input in some of the work that we've done so far. But let me say first that strategy is about filtering out the noise. It's about deciding what systems and individuals in them must do on behalf of students and their learning and put those priorities into action. Developing priorities requires us to identify high leverage areas. And if we have too many actions, we either need more people to implement those actions, or we must rank our priorities in order of importance. So since the beginning of the year, we've talked a lot about student achievement, um, but we also need to talk about student experiences. So these two circles are kind of really important and they, and they do overlap. Student achievement, when you think of student achievement, you think of high impact instructional strategies and the clear actions that are needed uh, to improve student learning. And at the beginning of the year in October, we've also talked about goals and metrics related to student achievement. And we introduced the idea of a district improvement plan, a school improvement plan, actions related to those, uh, the SIP and the DIP, and how we monitor progress in those areas. We also, in education, need to change the script. But we need to be really good at teaching students. And if we're really good at teaching students, it builds confidence in our system. And one of the things we have to really focus on is not to teach the students that are in front of us tonight and students in our classroom the same way that we So um, in order to do that, we really need to pay close attention to kind of research-based practices. All of these things together, high quality instruction, goals and metrics, and focusing on research-based practices form the student achievement bubble on the left. We also need to make sure we're focusing on student experiences. And that's where our strategic priorities come into play. We need to name them and also rank them in important. We need to define the values of our school system where relationships are critical for learning. And um, we need to develop something called a portrait of a graduate, which is really how do we define what deeper learning looks like? How do we ensure that students' interests are stimulated in the classroom? And how do we implement those actions and not just name them or describe them? 
So some of the work that we've done so far, we started in the spring with collecting stakeholder engagement and asking some important questions. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. Over the summer, we started to sort all of the data and develop measurable goals and metrics that the dip and the set we talked about. And mm -hmm. we're in the implementation where we're starting to write some of our priorities and sort these priorities into certain areas. And that's what we really need help with your help with um, tonight. So the process and our goal tonight is to collect input from Board of Education members. Our goal is not to make decisions or to prioritize our actions, but simply to identify what priorities have we not included in the list that we're about to provide you. Once we provide that list and you provide your input, we will be providing the community an opportunity to weigh in as well. This is not the final draft of a public plan. It's just one way that we're collecting uh, information from them. So we've asked some essential questions. We've analyzed the data, which we'll share. We need to drop, we've drafted some priorities. And right now we're, we're focused on kind of getting your input so that you can add what we're missing and we can streamline and rank our priorities. <clears throat> the work that we started in the spring involved many focus groups. So we met with all the faculties and we heard what they had to say around two important questions. We also had some focus group conversations with students and we learned um, a lot from them. And these are the two questions that we asked. What should the ideal school look like? And how would you describe the ideal graduate? What skills and dispositions should they be able to demonstrate? And um, this is some of the, the qualitative data, some of the responses that we received. This is from a community member. The learning environment matters. The physical, aesthetic, and intellectual spaces students are learning in should be designed and redesigned to better embrace dialogue and engage all students. When students feel safe in the learning environment, physically, intellectually, and emotionally safe, when they understand that failure is okay, that it's a part of life and of learning, and are given a safety net, they will over time become more confident, more empathetic, and better suited for the world they will inherit and lead. In this new academic environment, it is crucial that teachers and administrators find ways to celebrate the diversity, creativity, and strength of all students, whatever form they may take, in the garden through 12th grade. The best of those teachers and administrators should be celebrated for their creativity. Another community member wrote, our school system needs to provide a framework and environment that allows as many students as possible to maximize their potential by discovering their interests. We need to do students who are prepared for whatever comes next for them while feeling empowered while here to figure out what that is. At the same time, our students need a foundation that will allow them to function in our society. Finally, we need to allow our students to explore and experiment, which includes failure without penalizing them for doing so, e.g. a poor grade or a failed attempt to learn in a different and a new way. A teacher in one of our focus groups said this, students work collaboratively to solve problems, students negotiate ideas and give each other feedback, students feel comfortable sharing ideas and brainstorming with peers, students should feel safe and supported, Students should have access to a wide variety of learning materials, and students should solve open-ended tasks as well as complete growth assignments. Another teacher wrote, the ideal school is a place where students can build motivation and opportunities to build capacity to persevere, to be tolerant, to actively engage, to build capacity, to persevere, to think critically, to feel safe, connected, and valued, and to learn how to manage emotions and pursue their passions. This school would also cultivate community partnership to support students' interests and well-being. Another top priority is to provide all students opportunity to partner, to, sorry, excuse me, to participate in all offerings before, during, and after school hours. And a couple of students said the following: students should be excited to work within a competitive and vigorous learning environment in which they are able to push their limits as a scholar and perform the best they are able to. Students should be feeling pushed, however, not necessarily overwhelmed. Having a constant, strong, and steady academic foundation rather than something more uh, with leeway, well, in my opinion, improves student performance. A Joel Barber graduate should have the basic academic ability when graduating, but should also be able to express themselves and others, and the ability to analyze information and come to 
you are arming independent conclusion, which is particularly relevant in a world filled with people spreading their own opinions. Again, from another student, the ideal school should be supportive of every student's academic career while keeping their mental health in mind. Students would be excited to come to school to go to their favorite class and excited to play their sports after school. While being a little bit stressed is okay and motivational, it shouldn't be too much. Second to last one from the student. I think that the ideal school should be fun, not only fun, but most importantly engaging. Ideally, this would be on all levels, intellectual, emotional, physical. I think that creativity comes from engagement and it comes from clear and empathetic communication between teachers and students, students and other students, teachers and other teachers, admin and teachers and admin and students. Making clear that every student has someone who cares about them, is able to talk to them is imperative to an ideal school experience because our teachers are the first stakeholders to invest in our futures. And finally, schools should allow students to expand on their interests while also gaining the community. We had over 213 teachers participate and provide us with information, 114 students, 42 community members. Obviously, we can't sort through all of that data the way we just um, shared some examples tonight. So I'm pleased that we did invite some students and we have some questions for them. And it's just an opportunity for you to hear what the students um, would like to say. Uh, these students don't represent every Joel Barlow student, they don't represent every student in our system, um, but it is good at this time to kind of hear their voice. So if you don't mind, we're going to take a few minutes to ask them some questions, open-ended, and, um, and then I'll get back to presentation. Um, the first question is... That's my can you introduce yourself? Oh, yes, please. Yes, <laughs> Dr. Maynard, yes. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Carolyn Roby, and I'm a senior here at Joel Barlow High School. My name is Dr. Almeida. I'm just privileged to be next to them. I'm just sat down and don't want to get back up. No. Uh, hello, my name is Owen Bowes. I'm a sophomore at Joe Barlow High School. My name is Quinn Sack, and I'm a senior here at Joe Barlow. I'm Lila Wojcik. I'm a senior. I'm Christina Roby. I'm Joe sister, and uh, I'm a senior here. And uh, my name is Sean McTague. I'm also a senior here. Okay, great. All right, here's the first question. Are you ready? We'd like you to reflect on the last 10 years that you've experienced in school, probably um, either at one of our two middle schools, certainly at Joel Barlow, and maybe even in elementary school as well. What are some ways we could have better prepared you for the next steps you'll be taking soon? What are some ways we could have better prepared you for the next steps you'll be taking? Well, I think one useful skill um, that would have been super helpful to learn early on would be to think creatively, um, because a lot of, you know, when I think about middle school, I think of a lot of sort of cookie cutter assignments where they teach you to think a certain way or follow a certain format, especially in essay writing or uh, any assignments of that sort. And so when you're confronted with a class like AP language and composition, where they're asking you to write sort of more open-ended responses and exploratory essays and really trying to, um, you know, forge your own path of thinking, that can be difficult when you aren't used to having um, a lack of a prompt. To um, build on that idea, there's this idea called divergent or lateral thinking. It's the idea of having, being able to come up with more than one answer to the same problem. I think that really builds on what you're saying because in middle school and in many parts of high school, it's one answer. It's one answer that's correct. And, but in real life, that's not true. In real life, there's many, many solutions to most problems. And if I, I feel at least that if students were taught to be able to embrace more, many more solutions to every single individual problem, they would be much better prepared to actually deal with what life is going to be like outside of school because in the real world there's not it's not going to be a b c or d so it could be many it's interesting because we already have in a lot of the curriculum so there's like that word and it's in the presentation as well problem solving which is what you guys are talking about 
but often when we see problem solving in like a curriculum or in a rubric, it's more like on a single topic. So like in a math problem, which is, I think for me at least the place where I see that the most, there is a question and we have to find a singular answer and maybe we have to use two different methods that we've already been taught to use. And then, you know, because we've done that so much, we know how to do that one math topic. But then what problem solving actually is, is taking a large issue or a large something that you have to accomplish and then applying different areas, the different types of subjects to then solve that problem. That's a good point that like you kind of a lot of school teach us to think in a very formula like way, like both in English when we have like a formula for an essay, and then also in math when we have like a method to solve a problem. And I was thinking like maybe in in real life, like a lot of problems are kind of solved like collaboratively, like this, like having talking and having these kinds of things. I think it'd be cool if that sort of nurtured more like the idea that it's okay to ask for help or like talk to people to solve a problem because that's really um, how it works, and that helps with like having multiple solutions to everyone being right in different ways. Keep in mind. Yeah, and I think that's that's not just a, like that's definitely a, a high school thing too, not just a, a Barlow thing is being taught that there's only one answer and that you have to kind of go at it alone. Uh, and I think that takes away our ability to then later on in life build off of other people's ideas and be able to to work in a group setting because we're so used to you know, going at things by ourselves, which you know, is beneficial in some aspects, but definitely I think more often than not, it is, you know, helpful to have a second, at least a second pair of eyes uh, on a particular situation or problem. Uh, and, you know, the, the more, the, the higher number of people there are, there's more, the more potential there is to, to think creatively um, and to kind of break out of that box. There's only one way to, to find what you're looking for. I think that a lot of the times I've experienced group work and especially like a creative group environment is that it often is a kind of a low level assignment. I've, at least in my experience, I've always found it like wellness classes. Sometimes we'll do group assignments or maybe in English, you need to make a poster. And it really feels like when you're challenged to work in a group, you end up being given sort of low level work. And then sometimes it becomes the kids that don't do anything and one person does all of the work or it doesn't really challenge you. And I like how we're talking about uh, using group work and nurturing that. But I think that if we could find a way to integrate group work into more of the maths and sciences, especially in lab groups, is one of the places I found it to be most effective is because that's when you're gonna experience sort of that challenging, finding a solution, and really trying to work with others in a way that's making you think differently, finding multiple ways to solve the problem versus just, okay, this is just one assignment that I can do on my own. And the only thing that a group assignment is adding to it is that now we have to divvy up the work a little bit. That doesn't sort of bring out the creative thinking aspect in the same way as bringing group work into harder, more challenging environments. Okay, um, we talked earlier in the week and I asked you a little bit about studying your interests and whether you had an opportunity to study your interests in, in, in school. Um, so if you, did have an opportunity to study your interests, how could we improve those experiences for you? So this, this question is very interesting. For me, I think the way it could be phrased is, could almost be different. It says, did you have an opportunity to study your interests? And I think that in school, the answer is generally yes. If you try to, you will have an opportunity, but you're not always encouraged to. You're not always told by your teachers that this is an option. It's not always made aware to the students that, yeah, if maybe you could do this. And, te and teachers don't always provide the opportunities. But I've been in the class where this is where it isn't an option. I've been in classes where it is an option. When it is an option, I enjoy the work more because it's just so much more interesting because I care about it. It's not just something I was assigned. So to answer that, I think the opportunity is already there, but so many students don't realize that it is actually an option, that the real problem is just awareness that, yeah, if this could happen. 
and that's definitely present in on like the individual class scale right in each of our classes there's usually some sort of way if students really you know try to find that not all classes but they may be able to find a way to study what they like in that subject but a class that i um am taking currently it's like a, it's it's not really a, a tangible class um it's called the uh, senior passages and that's i think how many of us are taking a senior passage so a lot of us are taking it um and it's this it's an opportunity to just do whatever you like but in a structured way in that at the end you will have some sort of something like a project finished at the end or something you're working towards and i think that's perfect because you are able to study exactly what you like in the way that you want to, and then also work with a mentor or someone at the school to achieve that. Um, but then on the topic, you were saying that um, some people may not always know that that's there. The number of students who are doing senior passage is like decreasing year by year. Um, and that may just be due to the lack of people knowing that that exists. Um, I think a lot of us are taking it because um, Mr. Umensky, who kind of runs it, like we took his English class where he was telling us to really take it because we can definitely see like the importance of being able to forge your own path and um, study what you want to on your own terms. Um, so I, I definitely believe that senior passages or senior passages are really important, um, but there is an issue of people maybe not knowing exactly what they are. I also agree that um, you know teachers, counselors can play a huge role um, in the, the paths that students pursue, um, especially when it comes to promoting those paths. Um, for example, the independent study um, opportunity that students have here, I wasn't aware of it until this year. And so I'm taking independent study this year, but if my counselor hadn't um, made me known of this, then I probably wouldn't have taken it. I would have been missing out on an opportunity to learn what I want to learn rather than a curriculum that's chosen by someone else. Yeah, I, I agree. And I want to echo what Caroline just said. The, the opportunity for upperclassmen to choose a, a field that they want to study independently and do that either through an independent study or online learning or a dual enrollment uh, opportunity is not well known. And the only reason that I know about it is because I'm part of the debate team and the debate coach is the person who runs the independent study program. And so, and you know, not obviously not everyone is part of the debate team uh, or has him as a teacher throughout their time here. And so I think promoting that, uh, like we've definitely fallen short on promoting that. And also I, I think that it should be uh, open up to opened up to sophomores who want to to do something similar. Like maybe, maybe not freshmen, just because it takes a while to to adapt to the new um, you know style of, of school. But I think that uh, opening it up to sophomores, whereas for context right now it's only opened up to juniors and seniors, I think would be a positive development. And similarly uh, with what Christina was talking about with the senior passages, um, we touched on this earlier in week two and. Uh, senior passage is only during your senior year currently, and it's really the last semester of your senior year where you, you know, complete the project and do everything. And uh, attempting to have something that's challenging uh, and intriguing, and you know, have it be something that matters in just one semester of your last year of high school. It, it, like it's, it's a very nice idea, but it ends up kind of getting lost in how can I rush to get as much done as possible and to get this finished. Um, whereas I, I think it was something that we talked about last week was just having it be called a passage or passages and have it be a multi-year experience where you choose one topic and then you follow that through your, your four years or three years here. And if you don't like the topic, you can find out if you don't like it, then you can switch topics and et cetera. And again, having it be an optional, but I think opening that up for it to be more of a passion project so that you can really solidify uh, an interest in something early on, uh, I think that would be very positive as well. And that also is important because of kind of how I mentioned, because you are working with a mentor on this, if you do early, um, if you do a passage early on, 
then you're going to be able to connect with this mentor even more over the years because um, it, that is important to have a teacher in the school or someone in the school that you're able to connect with and that you trust. Um, and I think that having a passage and having that mentor would be only help that. I think that kind of touching on what I said before about group work, sometimes representing sort of like a low level <clears throat> of an academic challenge. Some of the times, especially at grade level assignments where it's like everybody in the grade gets a chance to do an independent study. Um, like I'm thinking most, um, we have the wellness project that we had to do last year. So this is like, everybody has to do it. It's a graduation requirement. And that makes this experience of an independent study and a project, a passion project that you have to do on your own, often becomes very easy. A lot of kids really just kind of do the bare minimum. And there wasn't a lot of respect for the point of the project. The point it was it was charity based partially. And it was really you wanted to bring something to the community, bring something to the other students, and do something to just improve like Barlow as a whole. But I, again, I can just tell you from my experience, not a lot of kids, if really any, took the opportunity to expand on that. And it really became sort of this, this joke, like, oh, the wellness project, like, what, what did you do for that? And, oh, I, all I did was this, or all I did was this, and I got a passing grade. Um, I really like the idea that we talked about um, I don't know, a couple of days ago when we met about expanding those independent study opportunities to uh, sophomores and possibly even freshmen once we allow them to get kind of acclimated to the um, Barlow environment and especially bring passage down because the yeah, Isolde courses sometimes um, they cost money to do. If you want to take a class that Barlow doesn't have, because we, we have a lot of the foundational AP classes, but if you want to take one of those more eclectic classes like uh, economics or or history, or some that you're not gonna find at a medium to small school like Barlow, you have to pay a couple hundred dollars out of pocket for the opportunity to take them online. But this passage that could be a passion project and even expanded upon that, because once, once you take it the last semester of your senior year, like even your most challenging, like hardworking students, it's the last semester of your senior year, you already know where you're going to college. You're, your independent senior passage becomes less rigorous because you get to decide how hard it is. You're, you're not ready to put down hours working on this when it's the spring of senior year. But if you make this sort of a, an art where you can work on it sophomore year and build and then junior year, and it becomes something that you develop a real expertise in and it's self-directed over a couple of years rather than just this one project that everybody has to does that nobody really tries on, I think that just kind of raised it to a whole nother level. And do you mind if I quickly ask the people who are doing senior passages, like what are you doing really quickly and, and why? Um, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thing. Um, so I'm going to be publishing kind of like a, like a book of sorts um, of different works, like exploratory essays and poems and things like that. And I'm doing that because of uh, from my AP language class, all the works we did there and I really love the style of writing there. It was the first time I ever did like more of an exploratory piece, like Caroline mentioned, where you kind of just write about anything and you just go with it and you find, you know, the different avenues that it takes you on. So I really enjoyed writing that and I, I hope to continue to do that for this this publication that I, I hope to finish in the semester, but then exactly how you um, how you was saying, kind of hard to achieve that in a single semester. So I, I am I have to start early, but I have other classes. So it is that kind of, you know, more time would be good. Yeah, um, I'm doing a, um, I'm gonna design a game, uh, like a type of role playing game uh, themed around robots. It's just kind of a fun, like I, I've, I've been really into like game design, game theory for a while. And I really think it's like, I, I really wanted to use senior passages for it because I feel like it's kind of a niche field that isn't really covered by school curriculum like at all like uh any, anything about games so um yeah I wanted to make this sort of like it's it's like partially a game partially like a social kind of conversation experiment and partially like a I don't know just an exploration of like themes and interactions and, like how we can tell stories together so that's my idea um I'm basically just doing a big research project on constitutional law and constitutional history of the United States and uh, you know my 
So my, my insights on that and also my insights on uh, a potential future. And uh, I'm doing a classical piano performance and composition study. So just straight up learning to play, um, specifically classically based, and then writing a song or two of my own. I'm not You're doing that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, but I would, I would just like say something um, before maybe we move on. That what I once asked um, one of my teachers, why should I take time out of my own schedule to research something? Isn't for a grade? Isn't isn't it doesn't specifically help me in any way? I can't see it. And he told me it's because it's you beginning your journey to becoming an expert in the field you care about. And I think that that's a really essential part of what senior passages is and what an independent study is. And I just think that that's something that, frankly, we could do more at our <laughs> to provide the opportunities to cultivate a real skill. So sorry for butting into the senior <laughs> territory. <laughs> not taking a senior passage this year. So independent study, right? Yes. So what's that? Um, so it is a combination of an existing course here, but I'm combining AP computer science principles with a textbook curriculum that I found um, very fascinating. Um, and so having that opportunity um, is it's great because I get to explore um, unique facets of a field that a course isn't really offered at Barlow. And so um, that opportunity is really special. You might have some sure, yeah. Um uh, one thing I thought we should touch on is or like like at least briefly is that like both of you, uh Sean and, and you were saying like how like um a lot of or, or like you were saying how like um you kind of didn't want to take it because it's like it's not for a grade and like it's like where's the value in it sort of like and you were saying how like a lot of people kind of saw the like the wellness project the joke, which I think you're kind of right too. And like it, it I feel like it's because like when the focus is put a lot on school of like these concrete projects where you just finish them for a grade. It makes like, in contrast, the the stuff where you get choice and creativity is kind of seen as like it, it can be as hard as you make it. Like it could be like, and it's way more stimulating if you make it hard, I guess, you know, but you don't want to because you have to focus on all of the other tough concrete like black and white work you have to do already in every other class. So I feel like taking the emphasis off and like kind of what what would give an opportunity for people to pursue their own interest is like just less emphasis on like grades and having more time to put into stuff that's creative and um and yeah that sort of thing. Yeah and like adding on to that I think that's what makes passage such a unique experience is because I so Passages are presented at mid May, at the end of May at Bar the Palooza. So you're all preemptively invited to <laughs> come and watch the, the presentations. They're pretty awesome. Last year, I, I went to a few, and when the assessors were giving feedback, they said, you know, it's really fascinating that you're doing this. And I'm, I'm sure that when you go to college, uh, a, a professor or, or someone at whatever school you're attending will be more than happy to like continue this project with you uh, as your mentor. And that's sort of the thing that makes passage so good is that it's not a project that you have to do just for a grade, just to finish it and get it done. Um, and I think that's like going back to the whole creative thinking and exploratory piece of this. That's what made uh, our AP language class so good was that you, when we wrote essays, we didn't have to end them with concrete conclusions and you know and then this is the the meaning of life or whatever uh and it was no, it was very open-ended and it, it could be more you know this is leading me to a new question or this is leading me to a new perspective which i can explore in an entirely different uh essay or or study and so i think that's why passage is so special and why it should be more heavily promoted and opened up to more students here it's because it, it's not just a you know find the answer and then you're done so continue this potentially for you know as a career the the one other comment you made earlier in the week about senior passages which i thought was interesting in addition to all the comments you've made already you know perhaps being earlier in, in, a, in a student's career and so on was that you raised the idea of could it be collaborative 
right? Could you work with someone else? I mean, it's, it's an independent study, but could you work with someone else? I think you raised that as an important question. And then the other thing you talked about in terms of, did you have an opportunity to study your interests? Some of you talked about middle school and you said you did have an opportunity to pursue your interests in middle school. However, there was a, a slight criticism of the way in which you pursued your interests in middle school. Do you remember what that was? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we're, we're the same. Yeah. So we, we had this project in sixth and eighth grade, I believe, called Cornerstone. And it was a kind of like, do what you want, but not, you know, con confine it to this one focus uh, that, and, you know, it heavily influenced and periodically checked by, by teachers to the point where it was just them telling you what you could and couldn't do. Um, I mean, I'm sure that some people had positive experiences with it. Like, I think minus sixth grade was about uh, ecosystems and uh, homesteads in Greenland. So it was interesting, but it just wasn't really. So know. it's kind of like, you can study whatever you want as long as it's on this list. That was interesting. Okay, um, just a final few minutes um, and we really appreciate your time. Um, perhaps you can just conclude by answering the question or, or battering it around. Um, and this is one of the questions in our survey to all the stakeholders. What should the ideal school look like? Right, a big question. Take a, take thirty seconds to think about it, because one of the things our board members have to wrestle with is making sure we capture that in our priorities in some way. So, what do you think? What does the idea of school look like? Well, I think it's definitely a place. Um, where you can have the confidence to take risks and not be afraid to make mistakes. Um, you know, having that confidence is really important to, you know, taking the proper steps to um, achieve what you want to achieve in school. Um, and, you know, failing is, is a part of life. And so um, learning to deal with that failure and taking positive risks um, is a really useful skill. I, I think the ideal school is a place where you don't need to sacrifice what you like to do and you know your interests in order to get into a good college or to look good to you know to someone from a scholarship or something like that. Um, because that's, I mean, some people may disagree, but in my mind, that kind of marketing yourself to the best college or you know to the college you want to go to and kind of crafting your high school year for that, it's it's almost something that it's like systemic we can't as a school change that it's i mean maybe if like a, that's a wide scale thing but as a single school what we can try to do is take those interests from students who's you know that's the field that they're going, going to go to and then how do we change that so that they can explore those things while still um being you know marketable i I think that there's a lot of things that could contribute to the ideal school, but the one thing that I'm going to say is that I think that there's an issue with with the idea of conformity in Joe Barlow. I think that there's a serious issue in, that lies in the fact that there's only one standard for success, and that's getting good grades. But what I find deeply concerning about this is that it marginalizes not only what students might want to learn about, but what students find important about themselves. It reduces students to a couple of letters, when in reality, they are so much more than that in so many ways. And as, um, as Neil Postman, uh, the author of Teaching as a Subversive, of the business and person's activity said, what one needs to ask of the standard isn't if it's high or low or if it's appropriate to your goals. And I think that that is the core idea of what we should be moving towards at Joe Barlow. A school where conformity is not the goal and said there are many possible goals for success. There are many ways for a student to feel that they have succeeded after graduating Joe Barlow. 
Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Uh, like, I I definitely like the idea of like kind of questioning this thing of like grades, which is so like normal, you know. But it's like maybe that's not the best way to judge kids, you know. Like maybe it shouldn't be just on a scale. And and I feel like it'd be kind of cool. Like I I, I don't know enough about um, like what people have been testing at, at like uh, in like education, but like. I think it'd be like really interesting to just question everything that's like taken for granted at the school where it's like oh why do we need to have like classrooms i guess you know like why do we need to like do I, like i think there are so many different ways we can think of learning where it doesn't necessarily have to be the same exact structure as we like that is a school in our brain you know like uh I, I think i think that's something that should be experimented with yeah i think that i'll share two small anecdotes the best teacher I ever had here at Barlow was one who said that to me that she didn't care about my grade and that I was more than my grade uh, and she would have that opinion of me no matter what. And the best college email I ever received was one where they say, we don't do grades here, we do you know substantive reports or, or whatever. Uh, so yeah, I, I totally agree that we should be skeptical of, you know, why is the why is there is is the grade standard really appropriate um, to meet everyone's goals, and you know how much of an undue burden is it on our mental health, uh, on what we're really passionate about? I'd like to offer sort of a, a contrary opinion to that. I I would see in the ideal school sort of an enrichment of the idea of grades, and so. I've seen a lot of students who may be very bright and very smart, but they lack what we love to say, applying themselves. They really don't feel obligated to try. They have other interests outside school or things that they put above school when they are very competent and they, they really could do more if they, if they were willing to. Um, and one of the teachers that has had the most impact on me and I think always has is teachers that show a, um, love for the subject, teachers that just get, you can tell they like teaching it to you, and teachers that I respected. And so I think obviously that's, obviously that makes sense, but I'll offer sort of the most intangible way of solving this to you guys is that I think we need students to respect learning. Uh, a lot of times um, learning is sort of this taboo thing, and it's for kids that try too hard, or it's something that I'm not going to use in the real world, but the students that I have found um, achieve the most and do the best in the times when I feel that I'm most interested is when I, I respect the teacher and I respect the content and I'm there, there to learn it. And it's not even necessarily because I'm interested. It's, it's there because I, I want to accomplish something and I want to achieve these goals that someone else has set for me or I've set for myself because it means something to me like growing as a person. So I think that if all students could be more respectful and more um, invested in improving themselves, and even if that goes along with the grade, whether or not the grade is good or bad, it's more about the fact that they wanna be there to make progress. Okay, is that a good place to end? Do you want me to yeah, I was just gonna say like real brief. I was just like, yeah, I like one thing that changed my perspective, I, or one thing I tried to like do on purpose with school is like just kind of tell myself like, I just I I want to learn every like like just like tell myself like to have fun learning everything, even if it's like math or like stuff that other people might find boring. It's just like have fun with it, like be interested in it, and like I think that that's something that like every like everyone has the potential to do, even if it's something that they think they like hate or wouldn't be interested in. So I think that's something we should like reframe and kind of encourage in everyone to love it, love learning. Yeah, because I mean, I have like different opinions in Lila in terms of like education and things like that. But whenever I'm studying with her, I already feel more excited about topics just because of the way they're presented. It's like different um, because of that kind of just being excited to learn something, so. I guess offer like one anecdote. One time in, in English, if you have you, the teacher brings you a book, um, what I think separates students is a, there's a group of students that will say, This book is stupid. I don't like this one. I liked the last book we read. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to look up the summaries online versus 
my ideal student in an ideal school is like, I'm prepared because I respect the teacher and I want to learn to approach this, even if it's not something that I love or I'm interested in. They just have sort of a, and I know this is very hard to nurture and I don't, I'm not offering a solution. I just want to offer a goal because I'm, I don't know enough about how to actually do this. But if we can make it so that student wants to approach this thing that they aren't necessarily interested in, I think that's, you're going to get everywhere. Yeah. Um, what you're saying is it's very insightful, I think. I think that there is definitely separation in our school, but I don't, I think that cause itself, just to build off your idea, is that some students just aren't interested in the fundamental subjects that are offered at Joe Barlow. And I think that with what we've been talking about in your passages and all the other opportunities, I think that if we could just expand the areas of study, I think the interest would also rise because students would actually be able to engage with something that they care about. And once you start caring about something, you start to want to work hard on it. And then you start to go to sleep, excited about it. And then, and then eventually, you'll actually start to really love the subject. And it flows off with the other things. Yeah. And then once once you start like one thing, you'll, you'll like another. It's because at the end of the day, a lot of things in school are connected. Like you can in history, you can in a history class, you can learn about the Greek mathematicians that create the theorems that you're studying in math. It's fairly connected. So if you start to enjoy one thing, it's reasonable to imagine that you will start to enjoy more things because you can make the connections. Can I answer the question? Sure. <laughs> what makes this is what makes a great school. Um, these students were not handpicked for any specific reason. A few weeks ago, Dr. McKinnon said, Hey, I have an opportunity to take a handful of students to this presentation. Um, brought up some kids. It's like, um, you, you, are you busy next? And we literally just got a group of students and we went, and some of these, most of them were all there. There was a few others. And then, hey, can you use some kids for tonight? Sh sure. And but but again, these students, you're gonna hear about one day. You're gonna be they're gonna be leading their fields, they're gonna be doing some amazing things. Just remember you heard them first here <laughs> for free. For free. Um, but but they do represent many, many of the path that our students take. And, and it's just amazing to hear like how intellectual these kids are. Like I'm sitting here like. Oh my God, these are my kids. Hmm. I mean, not mine, but you know what I mean. So that's all. That's what makes a great school is just kids coming together and just doing that. That was not right. scripted. I'm just like, wow. So, okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Omeda. Um, mm -hmm. I loved the conversation as yeah. well and how you build off everyone's yeah. ideas. And we're actually trying to train students in elementary school to do the same thing, right? To have a, a, an extended discussion without much facilitation by the teacher. And that's actually. One of our goals, one of our high impact instruction strategies. Students, we're deeply appreciative for your time tonight and for helping frame what the ideal school could look like and how you think we can explore your interests and engage you more um, in school. And our board members now are tasked with putting some ideas down on paper and we'd be happy to share a draft with you uh, um, and for you to take a look at that. Um, and we'll be doing that with all the community members. So I think we can just give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Of course, you're welcome to stay. Um, but of course, <laughs> that, that, that may you have more Don't forget your jackets. When you get <laughs> okay.
All right, thank you so much. Um, we're almost ready for you to, to dig in um, to an activity. So really what we have to do is define high quality instruction and really look at students mastering knowledge and skills. That's the absolute um, number one priority. However, that's specifically on the right? Students, if they want a strong foundation. They want to do well in school. Um, but what they were talking about was the ability to go deeper by defining an interest they have in learning and enacting the knowledge and to produce something in some way. That was really what uh, some of the things they were talking about. And when we looked at all the data from the survey, we started to see connections between these different themes. And when you triangulate that information, that's what you're doing. You're looking for um, different themes. Some themes were stronger than others. We ranked them. And you can see there that uh, feeling safe and valued and learning the learning environment, communication, these are all the things that were at the top of the list. Um, and then these were some of the major themes that, again, that emerged from the data. Uh, authentic mental health, real world, problem solving, critical thinking, students working independently, feeling safe. Okay, so Dr. McKinnon, sorry, <laughs> uh, you, you, the screen share is paused. You just hit the play in the top on the toolbar. Okay. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. If you stop, I can just focus the camera on the screen and we can do okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I can try one more time. Okay. Sorry. No problem. All right. Better. So these were the themes that merged. And if we stopped there, we would have come up with just a set of themes. But we went further and looked at each theme and then ranked the themes according to how the community, students, and teachers felt about these particular themes. So the idea of authentic learning was one of the most important and highly identified themes in the in the analysis. However, you can see students didn't feel very strongly about that word authentic, right? Um, the community felt pretty strongly about it and teachers felt strongly about it as well. Students didn't buy into what authentic uh, learning meant. Uh, and it might be because they worded it in a different way. They have no idea what it is. Right. So um, mental health was obviously very important to everyone, students, community members and teachers. For students, this was one of the most important things that they talked about. Real world experiences probably gets more at authentic than uh, than anything else, and so students kind of brought, brought more into kind of real world um, experiences. Problem solving. You heard the students talk about problem solving tonight, right? Mm -hmm. Problem solving the way we define problem solving. Um, they do. They did not buy into problem solving. Right? They didn't buy into it because it was related to a problem that they didn't really care about, or a problem that maybe it was a word problem on a math test. Mm -hmm. When we think about problem solving, we think probably something that's more authentic, right? but we're not making that connection um, with students in that area. Working independently with a theme that was valued by all stakeholders, feeling safe and valued. Um, students like mental health more than feeling safe and valued. Having their interests explored, students brought more into that than authentic learning. Group work. The community really valued that, teachers loved that, and, and students were, were up there as well. Uh, healthy spaces. Uh, collaboration is pretty evenly seen as something that was important across the board. The learning environment, pretty evenly seen as something that was, again, um, pretty significant. Social emotional learning, students didn't rank that as high, but they ranked other things like mental health and the learning environment higher because they saw that that's how that was really relevant to them. Communication, students felt this was extremely important, probably the most important thing. And they really looked at that as a way, and they know that's a necessary tool for them to be successful. And making mistakes was obviously felt by for everyone. So um, just to re reiterate, um, what we're doing tonight is you're about to look at a, a list of priorities. And you're, to, you're really looking for things you want to add to that list. 
Sarah has sent you an email that has that that um, list of priorities in there. And really, what this is is uh, a kind of a Gantt chart. And this is difficult to see, but it's in your um, your presentation. It's essentially a list of priority, um, a list of our priorities that emerge from the data. One priority is high quality teaching and learning. There are various priorities and actions related to that. You could also see that because it's a, a Gantt chart, it has actions, measures, um, who is owning the task, the percent of which the task is going to be completed, when the, the task is scheduled to start, when the task is scheduled to finish. We're not doing any of that work tonight. We're really just looking at the priorities. So you've got high quality teaching and learning. Um, Another priority is developing a culture that promotes a nurturing and welcoming environment and deeper, more engaged learning. Priority number three is improving school facilities to ensure student safety, long-term sustainability, and uh, spaces that enhance student learning. Priority four is meeting the needs of all students in the various ways. Priority five is developing a K-12 portrait of a graduate that emphasizes real-world experiences and innovative learning. This is this this particular um, area is really what the students were talking about tonight, and the last one is promoting effective operations and skillful staff. Across the bottom of the template, you'll see all the priorities that we've come up with so far. The working list, and then you have um, different tabs for Eastern Reading and Region Nine. So what I propose that you that we do um, now is. which is really kind of our work for tonight, is to take a recess for about 10 minutes and really have an opportunity for you to look at that um, set of priorities that I gave you, to come back in 10 minutes, um, and then be prepared to discuss anything that you added in those tabs. So are there any priorities you wish that we have added to this list? We'll share that whole group. Um, and the best thing about this is that we're not focused on finishing this work tonight. We've developed a survey for you um, so that after we spend a little bit of time brainstorming and looking at the list and adding some ideas and talking about them a little bit, we can end the meeting knowing that there's a follow-up survey where you'll be able to, you'll have a more opportunity to add things to the list if you need to. And Sarah is going to send that survey to you um, in a moment. Okay. So just to recap, your task is to review the Gantt chart and look at priorities. We're resetting for 10 minutes for you to do that. We'll come back. You'll be brainstorming and sharing kind of what you added and why. Um, and at some point, we're going to identify an, an end point and then you have a survey and opportunity to, um, to, to follow up if you do. Now, is there any questions about that? Just to be clear, we're actually going to stay in session. This is independent work. This is not group work, okay? Because we can't have three different board meetings happening. So this is, you're all looking at the material, either hard copy or on your laptop. And then set a time for 10 minutes and we'll come back in and we'll go around the room. We'll hopscotch around and say, you know, did we hit everything or are we missing things? Okay, makes sense. Just to stay within the bounds of, what we're doing for you in other <laughs> acronyms. So, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Any other questions? Did everyone have the, 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 the Gantt chart, the priority list? Okay. Um, um, I stop sharing. Yep. It's not me. I'm not in there yet. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing anything.
Um, I don't know. Um, but then, I went to the of the five seconds. Really focus on the top there, six. No, no. Oh. Oh. Not the individual line of the I mean, they're very handy right now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. And we need help. It's good, just checking out. So we can teach you. I'm I could walk around that. So you yeah. Don't do that. I'm just trying to tell us about a thing. <laughs> no. Oh, it's on your own page. It's 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 <laughs> Chris is making some good notes over here, everyone. So I'll let you know. Oh, we're supposed to be taking them.
How are we doing on time, gang? <clears throat> that was 10 minutes. We need more time or are we good? Can we get started? Mm -hmm. more, yeah. more time? All right, let's look down. We're speaking at your neighbors. <clears throat> uh, in no particular order. Anybody want to go first? You want to go, you want to go priority by priority? Or? Sure. Start with the first priority, you mean? Or, well, yeah. we're looking at additions, right? We're looking at things. Sort of additions that are related to one, additions that are related to two. Fine. Like, that's, that's fair. Okay, I like it. Anyone have additions to the number one priority? I don't mind going first. Uh, Chris? So, one thing that resonated in the conversation with the students that can be added to, to one is ensure consistency with respect to the way opportunities are presented to students because it shouldn't ultimately matter who you are assigned as a school counselor or a fifth or eighth or ninth grade language arts teacher, what you understand the school's offering. So to build on that, I so I saw so it's like listening today, but also when I was in other um, strategic planning meetings with parents and students um, within that first priority, something around communication around what is success for. So this idea that there's only one way to be successful at in Eastern Reading Region 9 as a student, and it's very much about grades and academics. So like what is success? What is a pathway to success? And what are the divergent pathways? What, what, what is different? And then um communications about opportunities seem to be for the most advanced students and then also for students who are struggling and there's this whole gap in the middle. So like, what are you doing to engage? You know, what are we doing to engage 80% of kids and, and make sure that I think this young man here kind of said at the end is like, you have this group of students who could be interested, but just aren't that engaged. Like, what are we doing to make sure that that group of kids isn't left out? I don't know, I have a thought, but I'm not sure which category it fits in, but a lot of the things I've heard um, is the transition from school to school can be challenging, that middle school is less rigorous than the high school. How do we 
how do we make it less dramatic with changing between the schools in terms of course workload, challenge and the degree of challenge that the students have, um, I've heard is dramatic going over to Barlow. I don't know if that's under the teaching quality, but I didn't seem to grab, see anything in here that that spoke to that. Um, I can add one. Um, I don't see anything explicit about making sure that every student sort of graduates with the skills and preparation to either go the college route or the not college route. And I think a lot of those other, a lot of students who maybe choose not to go to college, I think it's important to make sure that, you know, should they change their mind, that's always an option for them. But if they don't, you know, we're setting them up for success anyways. So uh, as I look at it and listen to the students, I just think there's one perspective that we have to um, also bear in mind, and that's um, the essential skills, the, the basics. And, and I guess, you know, using a sports analogy, football's obviously changed since when it was, you know, first developed. And now there's intricate sets and there's schemes and there's all these, um, you know, uh, different audibles that each team is at, at trying to outthink each other. But a lot of times it still boils down to guys who run the fastest, guys who are in the best shape. You know, um, there's still an aspect of those basic essentials that is essential to kind of the winning formula. And I, I guess we, we've done a lot tonight and I, and I think it's great. I, I'm not trying to minimize the fact that um, students are thinking outside of the box and they wanna learn in different ways. And there's all these um, ideas that we have, but I do think that the educators also need to stress the importance of those basic fundamentals and those things that maybe are not so, you know, people don't, uh, students don't wanna do them as much. They'd much rather think about their passage project, but sometimes you really need to be able to dig in and learn these essential skills so that as you start to expand that you can, you know, develop even more. I, I think that, and, and again, it's so it's, it's a way of making, um, creating that awareness of that importance or making it interesting students somehow to, to not lose fact that basic skills are, are an essential part of your foundation. <clears throat> are you talking about finding a balance between, you know, high expectations for student work and foundations for these essential skills and standards um, in addition to the other things that students were talking about in terms of engagement and interest and so on, right? Mm -hmm. I thought it was like when you gave us our presentation, I thought it was interesting when you showed the graph that showed the importance of stating for every lesson the learning intention in so that the, the kids understood. Here's what we're doing today. Here's why I need you to understand this. Here's what. And just to, you had done some research and it was really interesting what a difference that made in the, the way the students were able to then take the lesson and, and, and understand what the goal was and, keep, and retain it more than homework. And, and this, this, the conversation you just started having about essentials and academic expectations and what we were, what we were talking about and what the students were talking about student experience is really the overlap between these two things, mm -hmm. right? Just because we're going to focus on student experiences and engagement doesn't mean we're not going to focus on student achievement, right? So we really obviously for a high performing school district need to do both really well. We need to have high student achievement where there's high impact instructional strategies, there's goals and metrics, we're monitoring our progress, we're trying to get better. That's the circle on the left. But we also need to have 
the circle on the right would really drive student engagement and interest and the joy of the learning and, and really prepares kids for either going to school or not going to school, whatever that is, right? It's a combination of these two things. Um, and that's what we have to make sure we we, we do well. No, because if I asked you to think back to your experiences in school, you may not say, I remembered how to graph that linear equation. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> right? But you might remember the teacher that really meant something to you or said, I think you're going to be something special and, and helped you find an interest and helped you go on a certain direction. That's what the kids talk about, right? We're talking about that, that other side. And we just have to make sure somewhere in our priorities, probably in the priority that defines the portrait of a graduate, these are the things we want students to do in addition to doing really well academically. We want them to do well here <clears throat> and define what those opportunities are, not just in high school, but all the way from the beginning to kindergarten. And how do we develop a common set of experiences for kids in that, in that area? In, 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 if we can stay on that, in my experience, the more you drive engagement through those student experiences, the more likely that you're going to land in the student achievement because you actually have their attention. And that goes for the kids who may be checked out and are not getting the grades, who now are walking through the door because they're engaged, because they found that authentic interest and motivation and it's lit that fire in them to go pursue that and learn those basics and really attach them and grab them but it also goes for those kids who are getting the a's that we see in the assessments they're not actually learning the material they're doing everything necessary to get the a but they're not actually learning it in a meaningful way and when you can activate both of those populations that's that's when it's all come together it's like you need those two circles to keep getting closer and closer so that the overlap is as, as large as humanly possible. Yeah. The, what that one student on the end described yeah. is actually a high impact strategy and it's called teacher credibility and it has an effect size above 0.7. And what it, meant, what, it, what it says is, is that this teacher is passionate about their subject and their content. They have high expectations. They have high expectations for me. I may not like probability, but I'm going to do well in this class because I believe in that teacher. That's actually a thing. I think it's a huge thing that everybody pretty much touched on a teacher or two who had an impact on them. And you touch on, we touch on teachers a lot through the six sort of priorities. And I don't think you can overemphasize that. How important that yes. is to the equation. Yeah. I would agree also, with that. But I think it's just the teacher though who can explain the importance of learning linear equation. Yeah. So the, the foundational skills are critically important, but it's the teacher who makes students understand the why and the so what and engages them to understand the importance of those foundational skills, which are necessary to get to the point of deep learning, which is necessary in order to have transfer in real life. I think also sees past this idea that Owen touched on about how students become known and visual, conceptualize themselves as their GPA over anything beyond that. And yep. building, keeping students from that mindset and keeping teachers from seeing students that mindset allows engagement to continue even after you become a junior or a senior. I'm just a B student or a C student because that's what I am. I shouldn't be engaged because I don't deserve, I'm not an A student and that's what A students do. Disconnecting those on an ongoing basis allows for that engagement and that achievement to occur, even if the letter grades aren't, you know, A, if that's what we're measuring is the most important. With regard to grades, is there a way to make the feedback more thoughtful? Not, you know, not just the grading, but a paragraph explaining here's here's where I see you in this class. Here's where you need to improve. Here's what I love about the way that you learn, and maybe we could work on this skill. I think that a lot of students, you, you're striving for that grade, but you may not realize that you know there's there's something that you're lacking. There's something that you know you need to do better. Something that you're doing great that maybe you didn't even know that somebody appreciated. 
you know, things like that. So if the feedback was a little more well, we, we talked about this last week. I I, I showed you again to a Venn diagram, right? And I said the difference between summative assessment and formative assessment. A grade is summative assessment, right? That's what happened at the end. Formative assessment are all the things you just described about students' progress as they meet a certain target. And that is what is really meaningful to students. And I really in the younger grades, they used to give like the report cards gave a more of a sort of in-depth, you know, description of how your child was doing. And then as the great as you progress through school, it gets, you know, down to that grade. And really, I, I don't remember seeing, even with my kids, yeah. any sort of you know explanation about how they were doing or you know. I mean, at the end, when you get these wonderful, like um, when the teacher recommendations for college, I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but that was when you saw that. And I think for kids to see that before they get, before they need that, you know, like at some point in their progression through school, if they saw, like somebody sees you, they understand what I, what's important in, as me as a student, you know, where they are on that path, that would be great. Uh, I, so I would add a couple just around priority one, like what is homework and like what is good homework versus bad homework and just really thinking about that with teachers because I, especially in the high school, I think uh, Jen mentioned this earlier, there's this huge jump we hear from parents from the middle school to the high school and a lot of that is around the amount of time expected on homework and we know based on Hattie's research like not all homework is good homework. So are there Again, just like building this idea and model of what is homework, what is good homework, what like adds to student experience and student achievement and what just is busy work that keeps kids like, you know, not engaged in in, in wanting to be a learner. Um, and then I'd say the second thing is this idea of group work and are we teaching explicit skills? Like how do you work together? What is collaboration? What is communication? What is cooperation? So that kids over time, starting young up through um, high school, like understand the dynamics of groups. Uh, how do you work together so that it's not one kid does all the work and, no, and like whatever. And then also teachers in terms of rigor, you know, if you're going to have group work and it's going to always be the wellness project that people just pass by and like, you know, bear, you know, do, but like just get an A because they showed up. So like, what is group work and how do you set rigor and like expectation around that with good rubrics and other kind of expectations? Uh, so I have one. I'm not sure if it's sort of priority, uh, sort of high quality teaching and learning, or if it's for sort of getting, sort of serving needs of all the learners, maybe a little bit of both. Um, I think the development of an integrated alternative program so that is that is comprehensive, that you know, when we, we hear about the uh, senior passages, we hear about the independent study, you know, you cobble together a collection of these types of programs and you start to find that you are activating a sort of segment of the population of the student population in ways that I think it, it could really change the, um, you know, sort of the outcomes for, for kids who would otherwise just sort of bump along and, and be cynical about the process. And it's definitely independent study um, and you know, independent and group study component of it. I think the idea of introducing sort of master class and bring your own teacher initiatives, where students go recruit a teacher to help them sort of through a process and sort of bring bring students to them. Um, dual enrollment opportunities for sure. I'm I'm hearing about students all over um, the state right now who are taking classes at Harvard, who are taking classes at MIT, and it's like they're doing this while they're sophomores. Um, and then, you know, not to get too crazy, but flex hours where these kids can engage, you know, in sort of sort of different ways. If they're doing crazy soccer and ballet and um, sort of other things outside of school that are sort of drawing them, um, you know, for certain parts of their day and, you know, being able to get back to that in sort of, uh, hours that, that are, are not necessarily traditional hours, um, that would certainly you know, serve the needs of all learners. John, I think what you said sort of flushes out a comment that I had written down that relates to priority number four, which is captioned as meets the needs of all learners. 
And I couldn't help but notice when we talk about the needs of all learners, we talk about special ed, gifted and talented, and basically that's it. Right. And that's by definition not directed all. towards meeting the needs of all learners. Yeah. And we have this temptation to say, as it was pointed out earlier, we care about special ed, we care about gifted, we care about elite athletes, and we care about <laughs> maybe elite musicians. And otherwise, it everyone sort of skates and uh there's opportunity there to legitimately meet the needs of all students by recognizing that there are more students than just a students athlete students and, and special ed students yeah. maybe there's an opportunity for some sort of student mentoring program um mm -hmm. on a volunteer basis right you don't want to sort of mandate it but if you try to put together a program where you know, students that are willing to help or build up other students that want the help, maybe there's a, a, a match there that could help bring students up that maybe need a little coaching or encouragement from, you know, star students that are willing to help others. Yeah, and I want to add to that because I think the communication piece in all this is sort of should be floating more to the top. I see a lot of communication with parents and between the district and the parents, but I think the communication between the teachers and the students and amongst the students themselves, like we saw here tonight, is what is really going to motivate them, impact them. They're going to listen to their peers. Mm -hmm. They're going to get information that a teacher might not be able to share, might not think to share. And you've got, you know, I don't know how many students here, a bunch of ambassadors that That's would right. be great soldiers for whatever, you know, their, their experience and I'm wondering if we're letting that information just walk out the door every year when they're seniors mm -hmm. and we're not capturing it somehow and I noticed the um the tools tend to be these tech tools we're going to improve the website we're going to read newsletters I don't think you can replace in-person sort of group work collaboration spaces whatever the form might be um but I I don't think the answer to better communications is let's fix a website or let's do more of it. I really think you have to be very intentional with what you're doing. Um, attached to that, I believe, um, is collaboration. And what I'm hearing and what I'm experiencing is the collaboration between the middle schools when you get to the high school. And our students arriving with the same educational backgrounds, have they gotten to the same places? Are the high school students spending time or the teachers spending time figuring out, getting everybody on the same footing? Are teachers doing enough collaborating between themselves to share best practices? Mm -hmm. Here's, and I know that some of that is built in here, and I think that's wonderful. Um, I think Randy said it. I, I don't think we can emphasize enough the teacher training and professional development mm -hmm. that goes into making sure that these priorities are realized. Mm -hmm. If I can just clarify something, because I think it's important it maybe it may be lost in this. Everything I'm talking about and everything that we're seeing on here, I don't think it's about the high school only, right? right. I'm sure, you know, you guys have a, obviously a robust program because these kids are incredible, but I, I see everything that we're talking about as being relevant at the middle school, um, maybe even at the elementary schools, but like, Absolutely. let's get them before we lose them. Right <laughs> before they disengage, it's building that foundational experience in group work and communication and collaboration yes. and independent study. Yeah, maybe it's in a more controlled environment, but getting it so that when you get here, you have all those skills. It's not, I'm a junior and I'm finally doing this wellness project where I learn how to talk, you know, work with others. Like yeah. that's not helpful. Like yeah, I would say I know in like certain grades, fifth grade for example, they do projects, a project that they have to design their own. They, the kids get to pick a thing and design like invention. Oh, Thank you. Fourth grade. Fourth grade and staples, but they, they don't do it. At, but uh, like, Buffalo. just again, it's like, right. So it's like, <laughs> what skills do kids need to have to do con invention convention in fourth grade? And what are they learning in third grade, second grade, all the way? And saying, like, how does that then build into some of the projects? That, so it's across the grade levels. Um, but just to really quickly develop what Alicia was saying, I think it's really important around communication. I would just continue to encourage consistency in um, parent, family, caregiver communication across grade levels. Um, just as speaking as a mom, we just, it's very inconsistent. Some teachers send you a weekly email, some teachers never send you an email. And what 
I think those expectations then as kids get older, how are teachers better communicating with kids directly? How are kids better communicating with each other directly? Um, but like the consistency of communication and the expectation of communication seems um, very much variable based on the person that you get in the in the grade level. It would be helpful. Just um, getting back to what you were saying about strong K to eight pipeline, it was not just about the high school and we totally agree. Um, the way in which Fortune of the graduate works, maybe we should explain that to you in more detail, right? But what that means is really good high schools have a strong Fortune of the graduate, which basically defines essential skills and dispositions kids need, right? Um, when they graduate. And NEAP kind of evaluates the high school in this particular area, and you have a strong Fortune of the graduate. Right? That's just one of the points. But let's say, for example, that collaboration and group work was one of the things that we decided to emphasize as the portrait of a graduate. In other words, by the time students graduate high school, they need to be really adept in communication and group work. Okay. Our goal is to say, if that's, if that's our goal, communication and group work, we're going to define opportunities for communication and group work all the way back to kindergarten. And we're going to start saying we're going to develop communicate we're going to develop experience with students to improve their communication skills and their ability to work with others and collaborate all the way from kindergarten all the way up to grade 12. so in kindergarten what does that look like and in third grade what does collaboration and communication and group work look like and what experiences do we design so absolutely that is the focus right and once we define the support of the graduate it's, it's it's really um, developing clear targets and examples and models all the way through. And that's the whole point of being strategic. And but you're, you're, you're all under something, which is we're not just going to focus on one thing at a particular level. It's important to look all that. Hi, Janet. Are we still on number one? Or are we talking about <laughs> <laughs> okay, number two? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hopefully, I'll move on beyond number one. To, to build on that, Dr. McKinnon, a little bit, sort of working backwards, one thing that, that jumped out to me from priority five about the, the portrait was making sure that we're developing a graduate that is ready for the real world, in addition to being academically prepared to go su succeed in college or wherever. And that's building into the, the K 12 curriculum, those experiences that are real world based you hear time and again i wish i knew more about personal finance when i was in school i wish i knew more about mm -hmm. the basics of of being an adult and working that in is sort of missing in the portrait that it's laid out there but how much okay. flexibility do you really have to do things that aren't required to teach things that aren't required by the state to you know outside of your the box checking that you have to engage in, like you gotta hit all these topics here, how much time really is left for some of these, for the students to explore their own interests? Is well, there time? Well, I think there is time. Is this, a, is this an aspirational thing that- No, no, I think we there is time. We really time. don't have it. There is time, but mm -hmm. obviously there's a certain amount of credits for students need to graduate with in English, social science, math, uh, personal finance is actually, a, a credit. One of the one of the things that actually emerged from the data was exactly that. I need to know how to do my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so there, there is time. There's not a lot of time, and so that's why we can't do it all in one. In, like we can't do it senior year last semester only. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. And we just have to yeah. kind of embed these experiences, um, start planning them a little bit more. When are these experiences going to take place? There's not a lot of time. It's but, the embedding though, and it's yeah. making it um, so that it spirals. So if we identify these are some real world skills that our students or community have identified, then it's possible to build them in along the way as part of another experience. So it's not saying that in elementary school, we're going to develop a unit study that's on personal finance, but it's making it part of that. Um, we're going to plan a spring vacation as a part of a fourth grade math class experience. And so there's a lot of real world planning in doing that. And then making sure that the students move through the grades, there are many of those experiences. And then when they get to the high school, certainly there's an elective class that they could take that's entirely new. 
and this is very um revealing and uh interesting to hear the students talk first of all i i didn't go to high school with people like this <laughs> that's pretty amazing actually um but i you know taking it all together getting in my head thinking about my experience as a student my son's experience as a student we both weren't the best students whoever said you know engagement student engagement whether the teacher engages the student or the student engages in the subject um that's I think that's the key to to success, and I can think back personally on my on you know my successes and, and my career as a student, and it was either the teacher that truly engaged me somehow that had that talent of, of making a connection or a subject that I was very interested in, and that's you know that's part of success. So I think yeah, you, know, you still got to check all your boxes, you got to cover all the topics, right? Somehow you can be engaging as you do it. That you mentioned, it's one thing to know how to graph the, the linear equation, right? It's another thing to know why you need to know how to graph. Them. And I, you know, I'm not sure if all the all of our teachers do that, but it's it's pretty cool. But I think that's where you get into this, where problem solving was mostly ranked by students because yeah. they don't care about graphing linear equations, but they're going to care if you say, now we're going to build a bridge that works, and then we're going to figure out why. And that you need all foundational skills to do that. But if it's disconnected, they're going to just check out and they're going to say, I don't need to know this. I don't care about problem solving. There is something that has come up here again tonight and like in other conversations around kids not seeing learning as like a fun like activity where it's like, I'm either learning something because it's I have to, because I have to get into college or I'm taking a class for fun. And I don't, so that disconnect, and I don't know if it like falls in priority two in culture, or, and may, it comes kind of back a little bit to, again, like this idea of like, my teacher's so engaged in it, so I'm like interested because they're like, they're thinking so cool, so it's gotta be kind of cool, and so I have to kind of learn it. But something, they're just like, they're, especially in the high school, it seems like either I'm learning it because I have to get an A to go to Harvard, you know, the Princeton's better, no, I'm kidding, but, or, <laughs> <laughs> or, sorry, or like, um, or I'm having a good time in this elective class that I get to take, you know, because I have all these other boxes to check and I don't know how to make those two things converge because I, I think that also creates a lot of stress and that like when you hear about mental health and it just like, so how do you see, how do kids start to see those? You can actually do both. And then school doesn't become such a laborious, you know, I have to be there, but I want to be there. They have to balance that with kids who are picking their schedule based on their collegiate aspirations as opposed to their passions. Well, right, yeah, that, and that's what they're doing. And right. some are, it sounds like feeling that they're sacrificing yeah. other things along the way or um, marketing themselves to just get into college and, and feels like they might be missing out on some other like, really discovery right. areas. Actually, um, I have to tell you, I sat in on the calculus um, class and uh, we did a day uh, at the, the school with the students and we followed around. Um, it's one of the hardest classes in the school, and to a student, they love that class. It was one of their absolute favorite classes, and it was because of the teacher. And I think that I'm sitting with the teacher, even though it's really difficult, I have to take them to get into college. Is that that connection they feel with that teacher, and that they make it interesting? Well, and the connection to like it matters. Like the young women who are talking about. The literature class, AP literature class they took, and they were writing non formulaic five paragraph essays to like write for like discovery and questioning, right? Mm -hmm. And which is how we write in the real world. We're often not finding one answer, but and so this idea that it can connect and prepare me to do something else. And like the teacher is able to viscerally connect that to like I'm solving a math problem again, or doing a budget to go on a trip for fun versus I'm just doing math. Which is a very different experience, even though I'm learning the same foundational skills that help me do high order thinking uh, later on. It still kind of feels like we're just talking about the high school. And so oh. <laughs> what I, I think what's what's important is, you know, you don't go through, you know, K to eight and then all of a sudden come to the high school to develop a love of learning. Um that that has to be started much earlier. Um and I think that's really what's uber important is that students, people in life that 
that are successful. Um, they love what they do. Even if they didn't start out loving what they do, they learn to love what they do. They, they develop that, that love and, and developing a love of learning that um, I think, yes, it's great that it helps to kind of uh, promote that if you have a teacher that's super, you know, enthused and, and really passionate about that, that, that helps. I think having parents that are super, you know, invested helps as well. Um, I think having peers that, that are the same way all helps. But, but I do think that's something that we, we can't lose back, you know, sight of is that you have to develop that love of learning before they come to Barlow and realize that they're going to have two hours of homework at night because that's that's you know the second part of that is analyzing why you're having two hours of homework and is it necessary but the first part of that is many students see that as i don't mind two hours of homework i love this stuff right and and so some students look at it and like are like oh my gosh I, I can't even look at this it's two hours of homework so it's it's trying to find you know a way to to create that that passion that love of learning and then work on the other stuff well. i think a lot of the conversation feels like it's high school centric in part because we just talked to a bunch yeah. of high schoolers and that's the lens in which they're seeing life and they're preparing to reflect and move forward mm -hmm. but there's a lot of threads of what's talk we're talking about here that go all the way back to to k through eight and you talk about oh it's two hours of homework in high school by the time I get to the high school, I hate homework. In seventh and eighth grade, these teachers assign busy work, and I associate homework with busy work to keep me from my friends and keep me from my activities. So there is culpability, if that's the right word, that goes back into the lower grades for destroying that level of learning for some students so that when they get here, they just see school as torture. Um, but if it's a main story, because if you, if you follow kids through, it's I love to read in kindergarten, I love to read in first grade, second grade, third grade. Then I had a teacher who made me put sticky notes every three pages, screw books. Yep. And it's dead. Yep. And it takes the right teacher again later to rehabilitate it. Yep. And so we have to be cognizant of that all the way back so that the kids who sort of tip, tap dance with the, right, the, the raindrops to get to Barlow still living learning are not the exception but the rule. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to jump in. I think what we also heard, and a lot of the students here were seniors, so we could see the development of you know where they have gotten to at this point in time. But I think that there's a really large group of our students, maybe from middle school through junior year of high school, who still have no idea what they're interested in, what they're passionate about. They still haven't solidified a sport or an activity or a club or whatever. And I almost feel like um, there's that opportunity after school that because of budgets and things, I think we've cut slim throughout the past years that offered an opportunity to explore mm -hmm. something different, something new, something you enjoyed during school, like PLTW. So I, I'm not even sure if John Reed Middle School has a PLTW or if you call it something equipment. different. They have something okay. similar. So the STEM major oh, engineering. Way. Oh, okay. they, they got a really good program. A ton, of, a ton of the kids love the STEM based classes, but then don't have an opportunity to do anything after school to really explore it without getting graded on it. And we heard over and over today how wonderful it would be to do things when you didn't have to just rely on that grade. And so maybe there's an opportunity for us, and this is one of the notes that I wrote down, um, to provide more clubs. Esports is a really big thing. Esports for the students who love computer science and gaming. There are scholarships now that you can get into college for, for esports clubs. We don't offer anything like that here, and we're one of the few schools in Fairville County who do not have an esports right now. It's a huge lost opportunity for so many of our students. Um, I think our STEM opportunities that we can be incorporating at both of the middle schools, but then maybe even collaborating on. And so we, we heard collaboration, that was another big word tonight. Our two middle schools don't really collaborate. And I'm not quite sure why I don't have the history to be able to speak to that, but what a great opportunity we have to introduce our children at a younger age before they get to Barlow. I mean, I could see some really cool project-based things. They even know how to Zoom now. They could talk to the other class 
during the normal class day via Zoom and then work on projects, um, take a bus over. So I, I'm even thinking like, um, and I know that with the pandemic, so some of our students missed out on this, but um, the science, nature's classroom. Yep. Nature's classroom between the two middle schools. Meet your potential friends who you're going to be going to high school with. I mean, there's so many things you can build off of. They could learn from new teachers who they don't hear from every day and build that excitement for a love of science or different things like that. I think that we've got some really great opportunities for outdoor classrooms, um, you know, be a, a guest student for the day at, you know, flip-flop schools, do different things like that, that just get them out of their norm. So that way they're not worrying about the same student in the same classroom with the same teacher working towards the grade every single day, right? We're stretching them a little bit, taking them out of their comfort zone, allowing them for more hands-on activity. I think that, that would be really beneficial. If and I, I don't know where this one belongs, but parent partnership is not sort of baked into this. And I, and I think there's an opportunity there. When you start talking about the students who haven't yet found their calling. I haven't yet found and not, you know, even the, the you know, I think 40 plus year uh, year olds in the room haven't all necessarily found our callings in this room. But um, the idea that, you know, what are those things that really draw you in? We are spending a lot of time every day. We are doing soccer every day. We're doing music every day. We're doing the computer science stuff. And we recently started to sit down with the with our kids and say, hey, if you're not feeling called by this, if you're not feeling like this is something that you are drawn to, like we can stop doing this and we can divert our attention to those to, to other things. We've asked them to you know, start thinking more critically about how they're spending their time and, and where their focus is. I think that's a really critical role for parents to play in this whole equation. And I think you know, the degree to which the conversations can start in some classrooms and then can sort of come back to, to sort of the dinner table or the, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the kitchen table. Like, I think there's opportunities for, for parents to be a part of this equation too and help to drive that enthusiasm and help them to find their way because the kids can't be in it on their own. That makes no sense. And I don't know that it's necessarily the, the sort of the sole responsibility of the schools to say, Okay, here is the path to find your passion. I think I think families really have a big big role to play in that as well. I I think parents' um, support is is essential. I, I agree with that. But I I also think there's a, there's another aspect of what you're saying in that I I feel like it's really important to offer that breadth of educational opportunities because. Um, any idea how many college students you think change majors? Um, I think it's somewhere between 65 and 75 percent of all college students change majors. Um, and, and not just, you know, um, the average student, top students, struggling students, they, uh, everybody, you know, finds their way at some point in, in their life. And you can't really you can support them, but you can't really lead them there. They find it on their own. And so I think it's really important that we make sure that the education that we provide doesn't just, you know, focus on the, what the students' interests are at that time. I want to do this. I want to do that. And, and we treat them as though they've already figured it all out at 12 or, or at two, Yes, because yeah. they haven't. Right. Um, you know, I had a math science kid went off to school and became an attorney. You know, it, it, things things happen like that. You know, it's just it's well, <laughs> there you go. But but I'm just saying, you you hear about the same thing. A humanities yeah. kid goes off and becomes a doctor. It's yeah. like um they they find their passion at some point. So I think it's really important that we offer that you know that breadth of education that they they can do everything. Yeah. Um. Not. And that's where it's it's finding that balance to what Dr. McKinnon said to to um, <clears throat> allow them to um, to be able to um, have input into what they want to learn without letting them decide 
want to learn, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I think we still need to make sure we have that well-rounded education for all the students. Um, and then again, allow them to, to do these other things that we're talking about, collaboration and how uh, I feel like it's almost an opening of a funnel over the years now, because you start at the lower grades with greater restriction as to, to how much latitude you're giving kids, but you also want to give them the understanding of what choice looks like and what pursuing passions look like at, a, at an early age. And you broaden that, broaden that, broaden that until you're talking about upperclassmen in high school who have now established competency in the core high school subjects. You can say now as a junior or senior, if you want to go pursue this path because you're passionate about it, God bless you, go do it because you've established everything else and we've loosened those restraints over time. But you can't go from a closed universe for nine years to a wide open universe for three years and expect anything but sort of a rocky transition. If I can draw an analogy from that, as a third or fourth grader, you're working with a box of like eight crayons. By the time you get to high school, you get the whole 64, you got the sharpener in the side. <laughs> yeah, every day. Um, unless there's more, I mean, because listen, this, this conversation came on forever and we can we probably should table it and we can always add input to Dr. McKinnon and the team as we spend more time with this document. It's, it's a living, breathing document, as they say. So, well, let's, it, it, yeah. um, we sent you the survey. So, um, we encourage you to. I took some notes um, as you were talking. However, it's probably best if you use this survey and put your ideas, maybe take a little bit of extra time to look at the the priority areas, and then follow up with the survey because the survey will populate into a spreadsheet that we can keep, and then we'll be able to um, cross-reference the, the data with what we've created so far. That would be really helpful. When would you like that survey completed by? Um, 9 a.m. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, the conversation about next steps is really important. If we can get a draft and we can define that you've got goals and metrics and steps and bits, and here's the things we're paying attention to student achievement. These are our strategic priorities, um, and these are all the priorities we think are important. The next really important piece of this is around the budget process, because we have more priorities here than we could possibly accomplish. Um, in in one year or two years or three years, right? It's going to take its time to identify. But some things are more important than we can do right away. Some things are going to take time. Some things have budget dollars attached. So, again, if you could um, really take time to review this and answer that survey um, by the end of next week, then um, we can start streamlining and getting it to the to the um, to the point where. We can put together a draft and share it with families and ask families the same thing. You know, what is it you think is different? Uh, and then we get to the budget process and we can start identifying what are the things we really need to do this year versus next year with like capital improvement plan for 15 schools, right? So I would love to have it. Do we, we have a January tri board meeting? Yes. I'd love to have this strategic plan. Completely finalized by tribal meeting. It's around about the time we sent the first draft of the budget. We've been arranging anyway. January 5th, does that ring a bell? The next tribe board? It's not familiar. Um, January 6th. Okay. Okay. It's still subject to, to conversation, I think, because we're working with the administration to figure out when the budget the calendar will all sort of slide. It'll be in January. Yeah, because wasn't there some discussion about having two meetings in January, one specifically aimed, aimed at this and the other one to be financial? Yeah, well, I think so. I think there's been discussions as to the timing of when the presentations of the budgets to the K to eight districts would occur and when is the logical presentation of the central office budget? Um, and when would administration be prepared 
to give said presentation. So, um, yeah, I, I, I guess Dr. McKinnon seems like he's got a, a plan, but I would, um, I would urge you not to bite off too much because um, this is a living document, and and maybe at some point we're gonna we're gonna need to keep honing it in and and you know going through what we can do right away and what we're gonna take time and and all those things and and that's gonna take time to kind of shape all that out. Um, but I, so I don't. I guess what I'm saying is I don't know whether you would be ready on January 5th to present a final. I think though your draft, point, like and, uh, it, it is a, a living, breathing document. I think that we are at a relatively advanced stage now, where when it goes through this review and then public feedback, we'll be in a position to collaborate on priorities within priorities because some of those priorities will need to inform this budget cycle. Correct. What we're saying, we're waiting a full eighteen months before we're implementing any of this. Right. I, I think if it's if it's say the first week of January, it yes. is it's the the priorities of the priorities, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the things that you that you want to tackle first. Correct. And you define the time frame around tackling them if it's the first year and it's these three items or what have you. Okay. The, uh, just to, to note that that meeting that was, that's on the sixth, that's just the standing good policy meeting. So I don't think we had to sit. Yeah. For the benefit of the boards, the, the chair has preliminarily talked about Tuesday, January 10th being an Easton meeting and Thursday, January 12th being a Reading meeting, which would be a combined business and budget presentation. You guys want to go late and last, right? We'd like to go first, but I don't think you're going to let us. <laughs> yeah, Mike's agreed to do it all in one meeting this year. Right? <laughs> right. We're almost there. I don't <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh we're going to wrap that and we're going to call that a conclusion to uh strategic priorities unless there's anything else thank you so much for the work on this uh joint board committee reports is there anything that anybody wants to contribute to the joint board committee no um, yeah. The next CEI task force meeting is December 5th at 7 p.m. in this room. Uh, we have three brand new student reps. I sent an email out to the task force a bit ago and let them know those folks. And they've been added to a committee list. Um, okay. We're just briefly talking about the so collaboration between the Joint Policy Committee and the Region 9 Policy Committee. We are meeting this Friday at 8 a.m. Um, either B square. Uh, we've moved to our monthly cadence, which is wonderful, um, with the intention of moving to quarterly as soon as possible. Um, we've got essentially our task for this first uh, for this meeting is that we're we're looking at all the things that we had on the shelf, and we're looking at all the things that we uh, received from shipment and, and good one is the sort of new policy priorities that have come up over the, over the course of the last twelve months, and um, sort of coming to that meeting with our priorities. So, you know, which things do we think are most urgent for us to, to move to the boards um, as soon as possible? Just for 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Yeah, moving it up for daylight savings time? Or uh, I think it was about availability for, for members, and I think maybe somebody has a tea time at, say, 9.40. <laughs> um, one topic we haven't talked about in a couple of years, and I kind of miss it, is the bus depot. So, um, <laughs> And I call <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, and you know, I'm on the bus committee, so I, I'm going to take an initiative at least in Easton to start talking to folks about that. Maybe I'll uh, pick on Sarah to put me in touch with the folks at uh, First Student and see what their lease looks like, and then maybe First Selectman in Easton and in Reading. You guys are welcome <clears throat> to volunteer ten acres. Well, I, I stand by my assertion, and maybe I'm getting lunch for it, but I, I think that we're we're moving towards um, electric buses. I don't think we're we're going to be doing diesel buses for very much longer. As soon as we can get them not to catch fire, we would probably go to the electric buses. 
Um, and and so uh, that might be important. <laughs> yes. Uh, so um, I, I think that's important to kind of dovetail in that you know a, a, a town or a dish, you know uh, to put forward the initiative, create a depot with the tanks and the whole thing that have the buses there, and then you know two years later, three years later, all of a sudden you're going to go to needing the back them up to the uh, Samuel Staples and recharge them from the solar panels or whatever. Like, so I, I think it's it's a complicated... Because we're a year away from the RFP process again. Or from the yeah, I believe we're, we're a year away. Spring, summer, I think. Or we're the so we're a year away for a contract that ends at the end of next, end of 24. Right? Yes. Yeah. That's fine. In the end, this is, for my two cents, this is a town thing. This is Easton Town or Reading or some other town to make us an offer. Right now, Bethel makes us an offer, right? To the tune of $150,000, $175,000 a year. Um, so, um, but in the interest of either the betterment of Easton or Reading and or the school, you know, to, to the school district, it's it's no different than Central Office. What's the plan? I, I'll find the bus depot in, in Bethel where I live next yeah. to my gym. And I see the every day. Sometimes I think they need to close the gate. We need to close the gate there. We have every person in that part. See, another reason for us to say that's another topic. Any other one once going twice? Is it important for comment? No. No, not yet. Committee. We're getting there. We're getting there. This is committees. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to board member comments. I just want to thank the administration for the, the thoughtful presentation and all of this work. It feels like there is considerable momentum in the right direction, uh, but it feels like the first time in a long time. So thank you very much. And uh, secondly, for the benefit of the Region 9 Eastern Colleagues, this is John Stanahan, our new Reading board member. Welcome, Welcome John. I uh, hope you didn't scare you. <laughs> Um, I just want to say thank you to the administration, but more, well, more importantly, most importantly, uh, to the students. I know they're not here, but I think that was a really great idea to bring um, students into this room and like give us some opportunity to hear from them because at the end of the day, they are the most important stakeholders we have, in my opinion, in the board. And I think it would be lovely to hear from students more often, not only our high school students, but you know, there are opportunities to also hear from younger younger kids just about their experience um, or even through you, their experience, I think it is really valuable to hear from them what is working, what isn't working. And they do have a beautiful way of being um, honest and vulnerable. And I think it's really powerful to hear from them, especially as we go into what is the more challenging part of our work, which is budget season. So thank you. I'll say that out of all the time I've been on the board, this was my favorite meeting mm -hmm. by far. Um, not only because of the students, but because it's I'm leaving with so much hope for what the future holds for our children, the the plans and the and the changes for the better that are really feel good. Um, I have a, a little thing to thank you again. Love this. Love that focus um, and sort of focus on student outcomes. I want to um, just quick call out some shout outs to um, some winning that's happening in, in our um, winning. winning, right? All we do is win. So that's great. Um, there are a uh, set of 11th graders who've been um, working together for several years doing a, a competition sponsored by the US Air Force called Cyber Patriot. Um, that team competed in the first round of um, of the, the competition this this last weekend, and um, had a near perfect score. Yeah. Did an amazing job, um, led by Captain Alex Weiss, um, and contributors Siddharth Gupta, uh, Kai Lee, Emily Floss, and Nate Knorr, um, did a fantastic job. I mean, the energy in that room and the the sort of buzzing back and forth to the whiteboard and. Ooh, we got more points and they're tracking teams in California who have perfect scores and we're right on their heels. It was fantastic. We had a group of um, ninth graders. When you come from the middle school division into the high school division, it is a step up. It is much harder. 
and they were champs. They they uh, last year competed with the John Reed Middle School team, and now um, they're they're doing this as ninth graders in the high school division. Kenji Peretz, Charlie Viani, Carter Rich, and Abigail Avedon, rock stars. It was so great to see them, and they were just as jazz doing their thing. Um, so our 11th grade team were first in the state, um, first in the Northeast, um, a really strong showing. I have the feeling they're going to make it to the semifinals this year. I have the feeling that they're going to make it to the platinum division. Like they're, they're, they're great. And the ninth graders had a better showing as a ninth grade team than that team did when they were a ninth grade team. So a strong future ahead of them. And we did also have a uh, first in the state for our middle school division, but that's a very slim team and would love to have more people join that. That's just Sam and Alex um, Stinson, my guess. Um, so we'd love to see some other other eighth graders join them, um, but they they did well as well. Um, and then uh, Mr. Holmes over at John Reed Middle School has four full teams of competitors. That's phenomenal. You know, kids shut out too. What's that? The kids who want to do it shut out. Oh wow! Because there weren't there was enough space. Well, interesting. We might be able to. Yeah, we might. Well, no, I think they could actually uh, join join that team because we have a, a cross border <laughs> cross border team there. Um, so we should talk. Um, and then finally, um, and you know, I don't want to say more importantly, but you know, Barlow beat Nasik tonight, two to one, with goals <laughs> scored by Grayson Vanderberg, and, and Aiden also scored a goal. So you know, go go Barlow. Any updates of people not related to? <laughs> <laughs> I know it seems like that. <laughs> Sorry. I want to say thank you again and thank you to the students who aren't here. Yes, I would echo what you said, Jen. This is my favorite joint board meeting, and I was happy to be here and to absorb all the energy from them. It's funny how they don't really understand authenticity, but I they were so authentic today, right? So I think we just have to use them as the example. Um, and I love that we have room for improvement on things. I think that that just shows room for growth and what we can be and who we want to be. And um, I'm just honored to, to be here amongst all of you to help bring that forth into the community and uh, look forward to what we can do together. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you didn't mention the football team. And yeah, it's all about them. But no, I, I also want to um, shout out and thank the administration. Um, I feel like joint board meetings in the past have been um, a little bit of a tension convention a lot of times uh, with, and, and I think you know, believe it or not, I don't want to shirk the blame because I think we all shoulder it at times, but um, it comes from the top and, and a unified approach um, that kind of uh, unites the districts and, and identifies common, you know, path forward, um, I think is really refreshing. Um, I think that it's, um, this is the, believe it or not, this is the easy part. The, the hard part is, is actually making it work, putting it into, into action. But but I'm 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 encouraged. I, I feel um you know uh, very confident that we have an administrative team that's putting forward that um I think to what Sarah said, recognizing that we have areas that we can improve and rather than making excuses or kind of, you know, shirking and hiding behind our deficiencies, we're embracing them and figuring out how to overcome them and move forward. And I think that's something that's, you know, uh, positive for not just for us, but for our students and our communities as well. So I, I appreciate that. So thank you. Yes, echo everybody's sentiments and I won't repeat them. <laughs> I'll take a motion to adjourn the meeting. Excellent. Reading. Mike, second John. No objection. Reading is adjourned at 8 10, 9 44. 8 to 9. Second. Second by Sarah. Any objections? No. Nope. Adjourned by the